Welcome to episode 174 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Australian filmmaker Matt Drummond, who recently wrote, directed, and produced a CGI-heavy family-friendly film called My Pet Dinosaur. We talk about his career as a visual effects artist and how that led him to writing and producing his own feature films that use visual effects, so stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Over on iTunes, I want to thank ScreenWrite, who left me a very nice review. Thank you for that. It's very much appreciated. It seems like ScreenWrite really liked the recent interview I did with Mark Hanley, which is episode number 170. This is great feedback to hear. I really have no way of knowing what episodes of the podcast people like and which ones they don't like. So please do let me know if there are specific things you like or don't like. Obviously, I prefer if there is something you don't like, you can tweet at me or send me an email, info at sellingyourscreenplay.com. But really, any honest feedback is very much appreciated. And especially if you have something positive to say, like ScreenWrite did, it's very nice to see these public comments on places like iTunes. So thank you again, ScreenWrite for that very nice bit of feedback. And just to clarify, episode number 170 with Mark Hanley, he is a guy who did a short film, which I really liked, and he did it all for about $200. And in episode 170, we really go through his whole process of how he made that film. I'm going to be rolling out a bunch of similar episodes with short filmmakers over the next couple of months. And I think Mark's is a great first episode in that series because he did it so cheaply. Some of these other filmmakers spent a little bit more money. One of the interviews I just did last week which will be airing in a couple of months. Um, he did his short film for, I think, about $15,000. I've got another one in the can where a filmmaker did his short for three or $4,000. So each one of these, the budgets are going to get a little bit bigger, and you can kind of see what, produces what that where that money goes and again it's just going to be a good um, sort of primer if you're thinking thinking about shooting your own film these iTunes reviews are very helpful it helps the podcast get listed in more places in iTunes so it reaches a broader audience also if you subscribe to the podcast then you'll get new episodes downloaded to your phone each week so that's a nice convenient way to stay current on the podcast if you have so if you have a moment please do leave me a review on iTunes and once again ScreenWrite I really do appreciate your taking the time to leave a nice review a couple of quick notes. Any websites that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then look for episode number 174. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a whole bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, if you'd like to receive that, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. So once again, I'm still working on post-production for my crime action thriller feature film, The Pinch. I've got all the pieces in place in terms of the post-production team, and I'm now just waiting for these various technical folks to do their part to the film. Once production is officially done, which at this point is probably going to be June or July, I'm going to run a webinar where I go through the entire process of making this film. I'll be digging into all the nitty gritty details, writing the script, how I raised the money, where I spent the money, how I found all my cast and crew, really everything I did to produce this movie I'll be talking about in that webinar. So keep an eye out for that probably in August or September. The other thing I did this past week was I re-optioned my baseball comedy script to the producer who has had it now for a couple of years. I've talked about this script on the podcast numerous times over the last few years, and now we're hopefully moving into the next phase. So the producer went out and raised a little bit of seed money, and he's hoping to use that seed money to raise the rest of the money. They always say that the first money in is always the hardest money to get, so hopefully we're past that milestone with this project. So basically, this producer is somebody that I met through one of my email and fax blasts 
probably five or six years ago. We talked on the phone a bunch of times about the script and eventually he optioned it from me. He got a few pieces on his end in place and um, just started to kind of work out some of the logistics. He is a producer in Delaware and the, it's a baseball comedy. So getting the stadium it was sort of a big, big component. So we talked on the phone, as I said, over the course of probably a couple of years. Eventually, he found a local minor league team in Delaware that um, he had a relationship with who agreed to let us shoot the film there. And then once he did that, he started to put some cast together. And again, then he optioned the script. The option eventually ran out and it expired late last year. And I talked about this on the podcast that it expired, but I had a conversation with the producer where he was still interested in the project and might come back to me to reoption it. So this is basically what he has done now. He's come back and, and reoptioned it. And again, hopefully with some renewed energy and um, some renewed, some, some additional pieces are now in place. I've talked about this a bit before on the podcast, and I feel like it's important that people understand what these sort of options look like. So I'm just going to run through this quickly. Um, this is, I would say, a pretty typical option agreement that that I've signed over the years. Um, it's basically a free option for six months. And when I say free, in this case, he's actually paying ten dollars um, for, for the six month option. And then after six months, he can renew the option, um, but he has to pay five hundred dollars. And that just kind of gives a little bit of pressure on him to make a decision whether he feels like he's got some momentum. If he doesn't gain any momentum over the next six months, then probably he would choose not to reoption and pay the five hundred dollars. If he's got some good momentum, um, then it's not a big deal to pay the five hundred dollars. So that's a kind of a typical way of splitting the difference. He initially said, hey, could I have a free one year option? I said, well, let's do free six months and then and then pay $500. And most producers are reasonable and most producers will go for that because um, the reality is, you know, there's sort of a burst of energy at the beginning of the option phase. So he's going to get going. And if in six months, he's not to the point where he thinks he's confident enough to pay the $500, it's probably a good indication that things are not going well. And then, you know, he doesn't tie up my script for a full year. So, so I think it's a pretty fair deal to both both parties in terms of how much me and my writing partner will make on this project really depends on the budget. We've negotiated for 3% of the production budget, and that is on the high end of what a writer can expect. Typically for an independent, low budget, independent film like this, the writer can expect two to 3% of the production budget. And since I usually give free options, or a lot of times I will be very generous and give free options, I always insist on the higher end of that range, more towards the 3%, 2.5, 3%. And again, I think that's perfectly fair. I'm, I'm, I'm giving him a free option for a while, and then I'm expecting a little bit on the higher end of the, the, the production budget percentage of what I would receive if this thing goes through. There is a floor of $9,000, and this is an important point. The floor basically means that even if the budget goes below $300,000, we'll still get at a minimum $9,000, and 3% of $100,000 is $3,000, so a $300,000 budget would be $9,000. The producer is talking about trying to raise between three hundred dollars and $500,000, so honestly, even under the best of service circumstances, me and my writing partner are not going to be making a lot more than that. Years ago, I had an agreement, an option agreement with a producer where I had 3% in the contract, but no floor. And the option was getting ready to expire. And so the producer called me up and said, hey, I'm going to make your movie, but the total budget is $10,000. So, you know, I'm going to pay you $300 for the script. Obviously, that wasn't quite what I had in mind, but um, there was no floor in the, in the in the contract. So I guess he was within his rights to try and do something like that. I was able to talk him out of that. So luckily, we never had to fight over it, but it really impressed upon the point to me that I needed to make sure that every option contract has a floor in it. A lot of times the producers will insist on a ceiling as well, and that's fine. Um, you know, you can, you can adjust on that. And the ceilings usually, frankly, are, they never come then it never becomes really anything because the producers always raise less money, not more money. It's very unusual for a producer to raise more money than he thinks he can raise. Usually at the beginning of these phases, at the beginning of an option, usually he thinks he's going to raise a lot more money than he actually does. And in terms of uh, figuring out what that floor is going to be, it's usually very simple. You just ask the producer, what's the minimum amount that you would consider producing this movie for? And he will tell you, some number and you can just say, okay, well, let's make that the four. And, and if he's serious about that number, he would have no reason to not agree to that. And again, 
when you're negotiating the option at that stage, the producer is usually overly optimistic about how much money he's going to raise. So usually it's pretty easy to sneak that in there. Um, and then again, it just sets expectations. And, you know, truthfully, I'm always, I'm up, I'm a reasonable person and I'm up for negotiating. And if this producer came to me and said, listen, I was only raise, able to raise $200,000. Could we lower your fee a little bit um, just to kind of conform with, with the budget that we have? I would probably allow that. But again, it just gives me the option to, to decide down the road um, if if the budget does fall below sort of what we've agreed on um, just so there's no surprises again it's just setting expectations um, so there's a lot of other just sort of legalese in the contract um, there's some back end points you know the writing credit that's another big thing you want to get set up especially in a um, independent film where it's not you know, where the WGA has no impact on it. It's not a WGA project. You're going to want to negotiate that writing credit um, very, very succinctly in that option agreement so that, again, there's no confusion down the road. Um, and we've done that in this in this option agreement. Um, so that's kind of the gist of the contract. The, these contracts can be somewhat complicated. And, you know, the trick um, is sometimes you do need a lawyer to help you with these things, not necessarily negotiating the major points, but making sure all the little, you know, the little things are in there that you may not know about. And the trick is that a lot of these, I mean, in this case, I'm giving a free option. So how can you afford to pay a lawyer if, um, if you don't, if you're not actually making any money off the option agreement and it's a tough situation. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to do your best early on in my career. I had no access to a lawyer. I now have a lawyer that I work with and, um, he's, done a number of contracts he looked at this contract you know years ago so it's just re-signing the same basic option agreement that I've had with this um, but I would say that's kind of the biggest or one of the biggest stumbling blocks you're gonna find is that you're gonna be presented with a contract and you're not really gonna be making enough money to afford a lawyer and so you're gonna have to kind of just stumble through this um, and and do the best that you can anyways I hope this was helpful but um, again I'm not a lawyer so if there's ever any legal questions that you have about your option agreement I, I would highly advise you to um, seek the advice of an attorney. So anyways, that's what I'm working on now. Let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing filmmaker Matt Drummond. Here is the interview. Welcome, Matt, to the Selling You Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, I grew up in Sydney, Australia. Um, I actually grew up in a uh, family of musicians, and uh, so I always thought I was going to go into music as a career choice, but I was captivated by movies as, from a, a young age, obviously, with uh, you know, Star Wars and E.T. and, you know, being a child of the, the 80s at the time, it, um, it, uh, it was all those kind of movies that really fueled my imagination mm -hmm. and I just wanted to do that. I didn't even know what that was at the time. I remember taking my Star Wars figures and, you know, photographing them in different poses and trying to come up with, uh, you know, little sequences and then giving my dad's Kodak carousel, which was this, you know, little, um, like a zeotrope. <laughs> well, I tried to use it like a zeotrope. Uh -huh. um, it was just you click it and then change to the next slide while we'd have these big slide notes. But of course, I tried to get really fast with it to try, <laughs> to, try to make it move. And uh, so I was fascinated with the moving image from a young age. Yeah, yeah. So then what was your first sort of steps to actually turn it into a professional career? What was that first move? Well, funny enough, um, I... I was lucky enough, my parents brought home the first Macintosh in 84, and I was hooked on what that could do and the possibilities of the graphics side of things. So I'd been taught to paint and draw from my grandmother, and um, so that was, a, that was a huge passion of mine, um, the, the visual art side of things. And uh, when I left school, I had an opportunity to go and... Um, worked for a, a friend of the family who was doing the, the cinema advertising before the movies came on, They're just the slides for local businesses and things of that nature. And because I had I had, had the, the Mac since I was a kid, um, the operating system at the time had not changed a lot, so I just got on there and really it was just a matter of learning the application, which was called Color Studio at the time. This was even before Photoshop was released. Mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. So I got the job doing that, and so straight out of school I was doing graphic arts, and after a couple of years 
I was, you know, moved up through the ranks to do um, retouching on, you know, paint box machines. So these were, you know, million dollar machines. Between what we can do on our iPhone now, but uh, it's it's a um, it was something that I was I was I was getting slowly bored with removing blemishes and you know various lumps and bumps off models for, for advertising campaigns and I, I got given a piece of software from uh, a friend of mine he said oh you got to try this out and it's something called Infinity and it was a uh, it's just a, the one of the first 3D animation programs available on the Macintosh and I was hooked that was it so I was then you know every waking moment and all the spare time I was using up all the computing power in the office just to make things because they let me do it mm -hmm. and um, I remember my boss at the time saying oh, there's no future in that stuff <laughs> so that was that was, uh, that was interesting and then I um, I got the opportunity to start my own business doing CD-ROMs um, for corporates and so I got more and more into the animation and animating things for them and then I took a horrible showreel into um, the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting um, Public Broadcaster here. They had a science program called Quantum that they used to uh, uh, have on. And um, so I took this very, very poor showreel into them and they gave me a job. And oh. so then I was, I was into it. And from there, my you know, that's when the filmmaking passion really took off because I started to work with you know, independent filmmakers doing documentaries within this, you know, big corporation. And you were uh, doing some sort of animation, um, yeah, motion so graphics. What, what exactly were you yeah. doing? I was doing recreations of, you know, stars exploding and, you know, the universe and dinosaurs. And, and the more I did dinosaurs, the more people kept throwing dinosaurs at me and, and, and dead animals. <laughs> they're, they're always trying to throw extinct things at me to bring them back to life. And, Throughout this whole entire process, I was learning filmmaking from people who were essentially running around with a camera and a tiny crew trying to make half-hour programs every week, you know. So it was a real – it was an eye-opener for me at, at what was possible. And obviously my, my whole approach to filmmaking is exactly that. You know, it is a very small crew um, shooting things that you know how to shoot uh, and then obviously using my vast experience. Like I've, I've now been doing visual effects for 25 years, so mm -hmm. taking that experience and, you know, melding it together. Yeah, so I think that's a good um, segue into your most recent film, My Pet Dinosaur. Um, maybe to start out, you can give us a quick log line or pitch, just kind of tell us what the film's about. Uh, the, well, the, 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 the very simple quick log line is uh, a troubled town is thrown into chaos when a small uh, when a boy uh, accidentally makes a new friend literally so he um, a, a bunch of kids uh, sneak out when they shouldn't off into the forest and they discover this um, glowing substance that they take home and decide that they'll experiment with for their science class and they get a little more than they bargained for uh -huh. okay so where did this idea come from um, now that's a good question. I remember having to spark the idea uh, a few years ago, and um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I can't, I can't quite remember where the, where, where, what the the exact point of conception for that the concept was. I do remember having the idea of 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 mixing stuff together to create life, and having what what is it that you could do. Um, with that concept and how far you could take that. And then, of course, you know, I was researching things on, um, you know, biological experiments and things of that nature. So after that, you know, those kind of concepts then came together. And, and look, I, I suppose that that's, that's the core, that's the core hook to the story. But mm -hmm. really, like any story, it comes down to the characters and the interaction with the plot of those characters so that uh, you come up with something, you know, that's interesting and fun. Yeah, yeah, sure. And um, I, I'm curious, and you know, you mentioned that you started doing dinosaurs for these documentaries and stuff. Um, you know, how much does that affect when you're coming up with an idea for a feature film? How much does that affect knowing that you have the ability to do these, these um, you know, realistic 
animations. Um, do you have ideas that are not necessarily tied to that, or do you just know that that's your forte, and so your ideas are all about that? Look, I, I suppose I come from a um, I come from the point of view that we have to be very commercial with what we're doing. Um, we're a tiny little studio. It's myself and my wife that we've we've started this. Um, my first feature, Dinosaur Island, was really a good, you know, the premise was not really, you know, what if a boy was thrust onto an island and what would happen if it was full of dinosaurs? And that was my first feature. The, the, the premise was really what if we can create compelling stories that fill a niche market in the family space using these unique skills that we've got? Um, what could happen there? Could we could create a sustainable pipeline to market? Um, and that's what we did do. That's what we've now done. And so obviously the the stories that we look at telling are ones that will fit into that, that commercial vein and that pipeline. Because what we've found was that, you know, you've got Disney at the top end doing what Disney does. And then you've got a whole lot of talking dog films at the low end. There wasn't much happening in the middle. So it was a big opportunity for filmmaking um, to be commercially viable to actually write and produce something of quality that fit right in that middle space. And from there, we've then been able to leverage into what we're doing now where we're actually getting, you know, the interest of the bigger players. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious, you just mentioned like family films, and I know you mentioned E.T. as being an influence from, from the 80s. Um, why did you decide that this was a commercial genre? Um, did you talk to distributors? Have you talked to other producers? What sort of um, you know, insight did you have to know that family-friendly films are something that there's a good market for? Well, uh, yes, we've, we've done a bit of research on the first film. Before we did the first film um, called Dinosaur Island, um, I, I looked at the, the marketplace and talked to some people about what was and wasn't there. Um, and then we took a punt and put that into production and, and it sold everywhere. It sold all over the world. So it, virtually every territory it sold into. So that was a pretty good indicator that we were on, so on the on the ball with something. Um, and then after the fact, when we're doing more research, because you can't always just sit back and go, well, that worked, let's do it again. Because that's, A, that's not creatively fueling. And, and B, it's, um, it's, it's a bit naive to think that you're just going to replicate one success over and over again. So you've got to be careful of that. But um, after then seeing the success and having the hard numbers on what Dinosaur Island did, in fact, that... That film had a hundred percent sell through rate into Walmart in the US. So it was it was a big it was a big title for um, the distributor there. Um, and it's done similarly well around the world. So we've gone into this one knowing that the family space is is a commercially viable space. Now, okay, that that's from the business end. That being said, as I said, I'm a child of the 80s. I loved those films. I loved Stand By Me, I loved Goonies, I loved E.T. I loved it that world building and the possibilities that came along with that. Now, obviously with my set of effects skills, um, I can build worlds that are engaging, that are fun, that, that people want to visit. And I think at the core of it, I, I was looking at a lot of the movies that I revisit and some of them aren't great, but why have they become classics? Why do people go back and watch them? And it really is that creation of worlds where people want to go and live in that world for a little bit. So I wanted to set out to create a world in this film that people want to revisit, that people have a, a you know, almost neo-nostalgic view of. Now, I mean, we haven't set it in the 80s and we didn't set out to set it in the 80s. And the funny thing was Stranger Things from Netflix hadn't even been, you know, no one had gotten wind that this was even in production, let alone coming out so it was funny that we were on we seem to be on this you know on trend at the moment with the the tone of the film which um that's a great thing you know yeah, you, yeah, you don't yeah. want to be behind the curve you want to be right on the crest of that wave and and we seem to be which is nice but um i, I stood out to make a film that i would want to have seen as a kid that i would want to have um a world that I live, I would want to revisit and live in. And 
I, I think that, um, you know, obviously you have to connect with today's audience. And so we're not, we're not going back to the 80s to get the 80s crowd, you know, the nostalgic crowd. We've got GoPros in there. We've got, you know, solar phones. We've got all of today's mod cons and technology. But you still want the ability to have some wonder. And I suppose that's what, coming back to the earlier question, that was what fueled that, that, that initial spark of the concept is like, what is something that using today's technology could create wonder? And uh, I suppose that's where the concept of My Pet Dinosaur came from. Now, initially it was going to be called My Pet Monster, but coming back to being commercial, when you, the distributors come back to you and they say, we love this, but we want to call it My Pet Dinosaur, you change the title. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So let's talk about your writing process just a little bit. Um, leading up to these Dinosaur Island and, and My Pet Dinosaur, had you written a bunch of other scripts? Um, were those your first, my, uh, Dinosaur Island, was that your first foray into screenwriting? I had written a few um, scripts. I'd been working with people writing screenplays and um, we'd been pitching a lot of TV ideas long before we started um, Dinosaur Island. So, no, it wasn't my first um, screenwriting as such, but it was certainly my first full feature that I, I'd gotten into. But, that, I mean, that being said, I mean, Dinosaur Island was not... <laughs> That, that was very. That was a very rudimentary writing process, and in many cases, it was a, a little haphazard as well. <laughs> this one, um, you know, it's very much a structured process. I, I think once again, you you look at the, um, you look at the marketplace. You look at what what the the accepted um, processes are, and try to replicate those. And look, I, I've been a I've read every book on screenwriting that was out there, you know, Vogler and Sid Field and, you know, and, and I've, the one that resonated with me the most just because it was just keep it simple, stupid, was Blake Snyder's Save the Cat series. And yeah. Yeah. when I saw it, you know, it was quite funny that, you know, after years and years of reading these books and, you know, um, hearing a lot of these guys espouse their knowledge, they never really distilled it into a process in the same way that Save the Cat does. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to say I'm a real proponent of that system. And I know a lot of people don't like systems as such, but by the same token, um, it's a blueprint. It's a blueprint for designing a house. And that's what a film is. You're, you're, you're creating a house and you're creating a world. And, and, and the better the blueprint, the better it's going to be at the end, particularly when you're in post-production and some of those issues of story do come up because, you know, as you know, many people said in the past, you write a, write a story three times, once when you write it, once when you shoot it, once when you edit it. And it's that editing process that, that sometimes things can go awry too. So it's really important to have a good, solid, um, you know, screenplay that has all the beats in there, even though you're trying to hide all the beats. Mm -hmm. But... Um, that is there to hang a film like that off. So you can always come back to the first principles of the character and the arc and and, and making sure that, that things are being revealed at the right time. And so it, it, it's quite funny, as a writer, director, editor, I'm, I'm always engaged with the story at every level. So it's been, um, this one's been a really interesting process. Yeah. So let's just talk specifically about your writing process. Um, how much time on something like My Pet Dinosaur, how much time do you spend outlining versus actually opening up final draft and writing the script pages? I think I outlined the film over the course of about three months. I, I was back and forth with it, making sure that the beats worked. Um, then I start, you know, start writing a little bit, seeing if, if those sparks, I mean, I'm a very visual person, obviously, and it's the, those initial images that you, that I have in my head that I try to, you know, that, that are the spark of inspiration for any any film, that, you know, you try to then place that into that framework of screenplay. Now, sometimes those images, you can, you can see that they're not going to work to start with, but there's something about them that, that inspired or, or captured the tone of what the film will eventually be. And I suppose that... Um, that first three months was really about taking all those ideas and that, those sparks and trying to, to, to put them together in, in a way that was going to, you know, create a sustainable 
screenplay because you don't want to just get in there and start writing and go, this is great, this is, and then you just go, ah, oh, that, that's, not, that's not good, that's not working, there's a problem there. So, yeah, I, I beat it out over about three months. And then it took about, uh, then it took a further six months to, to write. So a nine month process really, which I, you know, some people say that's fast, some people say that's slow. I don't, I don't really know. And you know, what was me. your schedule? What was your schedule like during those nine months? Were you working on other projects, doing some special effects here and there? Um, so it was like a part time thing, or you were writing pretty much full time for nine months? I was writing pretty much full time actually. I mean, I, I, in the fortunate position now that I'm not, um, I'm not having to to chase the, the the visual effects gigs anymore. You know, which is what I did. On my first film, I'd run, run out, shoot all day, come back, work all night on someone else's project, and uh -huh. then you know, get the minimum amount of sleep and go and do it all again. I know the, the, the writing process was, you know, it was the writing process, and I really immersed myself in that. And while I'm immersing myself in any particular part of the filmmaking process, I'm learning. I'm just constantly learning. I'm, I'm reading. I'm, I'm talking to people. I live in a very creative community up here, and there are just some accomplished people, you know, screenwriters up here. Um, you know, a great mate of mine's a, a, a very accomplished screenwriter. And um, so, you know, those kind of conversations over coffee really fuel you to, you know, push yourself, go harder, do things better. And um, so, yeah, that, that was the process. It was pretty much nine months intensive. And then... I was actually, um, I then actually sent it off for coverage to the uh, to the uh, the script store, and um, that was uh, that was really really great. They came back with ten pages of notes and emotional graphs and all sorts of things to to help me just try to hone the story a bit better, and and um, then we knew it was ready for production. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to talk about that development process a little bit. Um, do you have any other people you literally just sent it to the script store? These are not people you know, correct? No, no. no I, 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 look, um, I trust my, my wife's commercial um, acumen when she looks over stuff, but um, she's more on the producing side than she's on the, the creative side. Although she, she does like to come in. Uh, our standard joke is that she'll come in when I'm doing a shot, you know, um, like on the effects side, and she'll go, um, that's not finished right. <laughs> Just a sort of way of saying, that don't look so good. So, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so I, I sent that off. I, I really like, I like the concept of sending it off to a professional who had no stakes in it, no prior knowledge of it, um, and was coming at the whole thing from a completely, you know, fresh approach, whereas... You know, I have trusted friends here, but by the same token, I wanted to make sure it was free of any um, any personal, uh, you know, holdback. You know, sometimes you, even when you ask for brutal opinions, you can get um, you, you can get something put in a nice way, uh, rather than than get into the the core of it. And I do like a brutal attack on the work because I know by the time it hits the internet <laughs> at some point you're going to be brutally attacked mm -hmm. sure so let's talk about genre requirements um you know this was you set out to make a family film and i'm curious um especially after doing um some another film after you did dinosaur islands are there some things to watch out for um do you talk to distributors you know in terms of like too much violence where do you draw the line um certainly language um you know adult situations um how do you handle that stuff and how do you even just know where you've crossed the line and it no longer is family friendly um, language is a big one, but also there, I mean, look, there are some obvious guidelines for this kind of thing. You know, any, um, anything when you're starting to delve into, you know, territory that's inappropriate for children in any way, shape or form, that's a good indicator. You know, if, if you wouldn't want your own kids, you know, involved in the activity, then you're probably pretty safe to assume that you've just crossed over a, a ratings boundary, you know, if you go there. So... Um, you know, language, it's, what's really interesting is some of these, are, are, you know, early films that I, you know, have talked about, the language in those films is, you get an M rating for some of them these days, you know. Um, you have to be careful. We like to make sure that we're squarely in the, the PG realm because that is just, it's, 
it's a little bit maturer, so you're going to get a, a range of kids from, you know, from 6 to 12 is pretty much the range we're after, and the PG realm is a good realm. It's, it's interesting enough, but it's not, it's not, you know, going to offend anyone too much. Um, if you're crossing over into the, into the, you know, the M ratings, then you, you, you've missed the mark and you've, you've, you've missed your core audience essentially mm-hmm. because, you know, 15 or 15 plus is, they're not going to be into your, your family feature. Yeah. They're looking for yeah. the next Hunger Games, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, sure, or sure. They're, looking for, they're looking to sneak off and, and, and watch things that they shouldn't be watching, you know, that are, you know, rated for older audiences. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So let's talk about now you're finished with the script um, and let's talk about that process of raising the money and actually going out and shooting it. What were sort of your first steps once you had a script that you felt like was ready to go? Um, on this film, um, uh, once again, I was in a fortunate position. The last film had done very well. So we we decided to fully finance it. Um, Obviously, uh, with the visual effects um, and, and having those core capabilities, I don't need to raise that money in cash. That, that comes in kind, but it comes in well, it comes in pure blood, sweat, and tears, and mm-hmm. you know, five a.m. finishes and you know, you know nine and ten a.m. starts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you do pay for it somewhere along the line, mm-hmm. um, but the uh, the financing process we we. I had a, a couple of distributors wanting in on the picture early on, but um, I met met a guy called Fazil Tour uh, a couple of years back when I was with ArcLight. Uh, ArcLight was my first distributor, and um, I decided that they they weren't the right fit for this project. And um, Fazil, you know, all business comes down to relationships, and even though the 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 company that Fazil was uh, has um, had traditionally had a um, they had a slate of horror films. It wasn't the family features, and it wasn't in that vein. But um, he was uh, he was saying all the right things, and we became mates. And that's it's really about rapport for me. It becomes about people who say they're going to do something, and they do it when they say they're going to do it. And Fazil came on board and said, look, I want in on the picture. He threw his hat in the ring and also came up with some, some cash to put in to secure his portion of the distribution for International. Um, here in Australia, we act as our own distributor um, for the theatrical thing, although we partnered up with um, Pinnacle Now, who did my home entertainment on Dinosaur Island. But I developed a relationship with the exhibitors out here, so Hoyts is a major cinema chain here in Australia, I think about 20, 26% of the market here. And um, I developed a relationship with them last picture. And so I was able to just walk it in and say, look, here's my next film. This is what I'm thinking about doing. They said, that sounds great. Here's a letter of intent. And then I was able to go back in and say, here are some scenes. And so, you know, all business is relationships. Um, and I try to always be where nobody else is you know if everyone else is banging on the drama door i don't want to be there you know you want to be where there's there's silence quiet and opportunity so uh, that's that was what the family space represented to us yeah yeah and maybe you can just touch quickly on um you know how did you build some of those relationships were those through working in television for all those years you built some of those relationships or was it with dinosaur island you submitted the film festivals and what did what exactly did that relationship building look like yeah, it was with Dinosaur Island. I mean, it, it was, um, you know, it, Dinosaur Island's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a very different picture to this one. I mean, it, it's essentially a, a, a run run stop film, I like to say. You know, it's more in the, the vein of something like Journey to the Center of the Earth or Mysterious Island or something. There's, there's not a lot of story to it, let's, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. It's, about, it's about situational, you know, world building and, and running and stopping, you know. You, run from something and you stop and you have a break and you run from something else. So, <laughs> there's nothing too complicated about the storyline in that one. And um, But the it did really, really well. And so, therefore, it got the attention of the distributors around the, the world. And now, so, with this picture, um, 
it made it a lot easier because, you know, with those relationships, we did a theatrical release with Dinosaur Island and it, it did far better than Hoyt's expected. So immediately they were on board for, for whatever I was going to throw at them in that same vein again or in a similar, you know, genre. Yeah. Um, and the distributor, Pinnacle, who did our home entertainment, they um, similarly, it did very, very well. It did far better than they expected also. And so it was a win-win for everybody. So, you know, you, you develop those relationships and they like what we do because we are, it's not just, you know, I'm not just a screenwriter. I'm not just a, a, a you know, a director. We're, we've got a, a, you know, a mini studio approach. We're doing our marketing. We're doing our whole thing. We understand that half the filmmaking journey is that marketing distribution um, portion of, of the process. So it's it's really important for us to make sure that those relationships are there and intact before we we go to market with these things. So yeah, that, that, it was predominantly the last film that set those things up, but it's this film now that is expanding upon that model quite quite a lot. And you know we've we've honed that model. We've we've added people um, where we we felt we needed to add people. We've changed the mix up where we felt that you know relationships weren't working last time, and um, you know I, I think with each subsequent film we 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 hone in on the the process that really works and the team that really works. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, how can people see Dinosaur uh, or My Pet Dinosaur? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? We we don't know what the schedule overseas will be at the moment. Um, the the film's still in post production, so we've got a got a, a, a lot of people that are wanting to get their hands on this thing uh -huh. um, the these Australian release as I said is here um, on the 25th of April and that goes out uh, Australia wide and across New Zealand as well um, I imagine that um, you know depending on what deals are done uh, that the it shouldn't be too long after that that the, the film is released but um, once again, it depends on individual territories as well. They, yeah. they release according to what their own schedules are. Perfect, perfect. Um, so what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing and working on? Um, anything you're comfortable sharing, a Twitter handle, Facebook page, blog, website, um, you can just give us that now. And I will round all that up and put it in the show notes. But um, if you just want to mention that, people can click on over. Yeah, no problem at all. Look, uh, our, our primary... Um, page is on Facebook and that is um, My Pet Dinosaur Movie so it's www.facebook.com slash My Pet Dinosaur Movie and um, that's our uh, that's where we're getting our, our social message out too obviously we're doing a lot of traditional uh, TV ads and things like that here in Australia and you know the PR that uh, is going out is also across both you know digital and traditional platforms mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, sir. Well, Matt, I really appreciate your coming on and talking with me today. Um, excellent interview. I really appreciate it, um, and I wish you good luck with this with this film. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 350 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch and newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting between five and 10 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots. So it's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members. 
Again, to sign up, just go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Tyler Bowman, who wrote and produced the feature film called Jake's Dead. He's going to walk us through his entire process. He didn't have a lot of money and really had to use his creativity to get this film finished. So it's a fascinating interview about low budget filmmaking. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Matt. One of the things that really strikes me about Matt's story is there's something called in, I listen to a lot of these entrepreneurial, um, online entrepreneurial podcasts. And one of the, the terms that they throw around a lot is something called unfair advantage. And it's not a, um, you know, derogatory term. It's, it's something that's positive that you can use in your favor. And it basically means, you know, what is there about you that makes you unique, that gives you sort of a unique advantage in whatever business you're trying to do. And in this case, Matt is trying to make a business out of filmmaking and his unfair advantage is his experience in animation and, and special effects. And, you know, using that, taking that experience and using that is super, super smart. And it's something that like, I just simply can't compete with him. Um, and, and most of the people listening to the podcast simply can't compete with him on that playing field because I don't have that background in special effects and CGI. So it's smart to sit back and think about what do you have in your background that you can use that other people won't necessarily be able to, you know, use as well or use at all. And I would like to think in this particular case, I am an example of this as well. I mean, I have a background in, in programming, in running websites and website design and I set up selling your screenplay and that's sort of a part of that. And that's a part of now of my screenwriting career. And I would say that's sort of my unfair advantage is being somewhat technical and having a technical background allowed me to create the selling your screenplay website. It allowed me to create this podcast and that has helped me in, in many ways um, in my own screenwriting career. So, you know, think about the things that you do in your daily lives, your hobbies, your interests, your profession, and think about that and, and how you can potentially position that as, as into your screenwriting career and use that to your advantage because those experiences are, are things that are very specific to you and getting at those things. And, and as I said, trying to just get them into the situation where you're doing something that nobody else can do. It just raises you above the rest of the, the playing field as opposed to just writing that broad comedy. I mean, there's a million guys out there just writing that comedy or writing that thriller or writing that whatever that script is, you know, is there something unique to you that you can give this a twist and somehow put yourself in a position where, where, where you're really limiting how many people can compete with you in that arena. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.